So thanks for uh, those who are still here, <laughs> despite the long uh, day. And, and now I would like to actually talk about something that is useful, uh, not only for um, reinforcement learning, but for any time that you actually need to uh, op automatically optimize some parameter. And this happened actually quite often. And to give you some um, a teaser of what you can actually do with it. So here is, it's an elastic quadruped, the name is Bird. Uh, I'm working on, uh, on it uh, at DLR. Um, and here the goal was actually to optimize this, the different parameter of the state machine. So it's a reflex based state machine that allows the uh, elastic quadruped to walk. And what you're going to see on screen is different set of parameter tried. Uh, every time the robot stops, it loads a new set of parameters. And uh, here we are optimizing for energy efficiency process. And you will, by sampling the different set of configuration, you will have different gates, different, um, different things. And the very nice thing, it, it can optimize it in only, uh, only one hour of live training. In fact, in 20 minutes, it's already at good parameters, but in one hour, it's, it has uh, very good ones. And here it's not RL directly, it's just optimizing parameters uh, uh, for uh, walking. So what is, um, maybe I should also, what is the motivation behind uh, hyperparameter tuning? So there's many reasons of why you should do hyperparameter tuning. One reason is when you're doing research and you want to compare with baseline, usually you tune your own method a lot, but to be fair, you actually would need uh, to tune also all the other baseline. And this is very time consuming. So. To be fair with other baseline, best is actually to automate the process and, um, and, and not do that manually, but actually do that automatically so you have uh, a more fair comparison to the baseline. Obviously, automatic tuning allows you to avoid grad student descent and a lot of time uh, spending just watching the metrics or watching trying a lot of different configuration. And in the case of reinforcement learning, it will also allow you to improve uh, performance, for instance, or uh, to reach uh, a given performance uh, in a given an amount of time. So for instance, if you want to reach a certain performance, but instead of training during one hour, you want to train uh, for 15 minutes, then you may go for hyperparameter optimization. Um, and, yeah. and basically, today I'm going to talk a bit more about the high level uh, idea of hyperparameter optimization with the trade-off between uh, the number of configuration that you evaluate and the budget that you uh, use per configuration. Then I will dive a bit more into the details, showing uh, the different algorithm that you can use for sampling and the different one that you can use for scaling the optimization or for pruning the different trials. And I will finish with um, a practical um, how do you do that in practice? And we will be using the Optima library. Uh, after this small talk, we're going to uh, have also again a practical session where uh, you will be competing against automatic hyperparameter tuning. So what is hyperparameter tuning? The, the idea is, is a bit what you do usually when you have a new method is you try many different configuration and you wait that the training is done. So you give a look at some budget for each configuration. And depending on how each configuration, each trial goes, you may decide to continue the experiment or stop it um, more early. And the trade-off that you have is you would like to, uh, to try at least um, as many configurations as possible, but you don't have infinite budget. So you need to also uh, allocate smartly the budget that you give per configuration. And one simple way of doing that is, yeah, you, you start giving the same budget to all trial. And after some time, so for instance here, uh, a quarter of the maximum budget, you, you decide to stop all the, um, the less promising trial and just keep going with the most promising trial, allocating more resources for those ones. And you can iterate again. And at the end, you should um, keep only the, the most promising trial. That way you will look at, uh, um, better you, you budget, you don't give the same budget to all the uh, trials. And here, uh, this, so there's two main components in hyperparameter optimization. The first component is uh, the sampler algorithm. So the search algorithm, which decides which configuration do you need to actually try 
Um, and the other uh, component is the pruner or scheduler, which decides uh, how to look at budget or how to, when to stop a trial. And those are the two main components that you will find in hyperparameter optimization. So first thing first, how do you sample the configuration? How do you choose which configuration to sample? And uh, for that, I will start by, by giving actually uh, an overview of what do we want to do. What do we want to do is we have a performance landscape where we have here just two parameters, parameter one and parameter two that we want to tune. And we want to achieve maximum performance. So here, maximum performance is the red area. We have medium performance, which is the orange area. And then we have mm, poor performance, which is the rest. The thing is, if we knew in advance that landscape, we would, we would have need uh, after parameter tuning because we could we directly choose the parameter in a way that uh, we achieve maximum performance. And here also, you see that one parameter is very important, need to be tuned very precisely. And the other parameter, you can choose it quite loosely. It doesn't impact that much performance. And this, you don't know in advance. So what usually you have seen properly or you have been doing is discretizing this search space and, uh, and then trying all the possible configuration. And this is called grid search. So grid search is very simple, but you should really avoid doing it. So here I've shown two examples of discretization. And in the first one, you're quite lucky. You discretize, you have um, a good discretization and you, you end up uh, finding the actual the optimal uh, parameter configuration. But it's, it can be quite tricky and you don't know in advance how you should discretize your space. And here you also allocate the same budget for the unimportant parameter and the important one. The other thing is this method scales very poorly. So here it's two parameter and it's already n squared. Uh, well, it's, it's already a huge search space, but as soon as you add more parameters, then it, 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 it goes really poorly. So in fact, if you look a bit at the hyperparameter tuning literature, grid search is no more used as a baseline. What's used as a baseline is in fact much more competitive with grid search, it's called random search. So it's just uniformly sampling the parameter space. And, um, and in fact, it's usually uh, much, it's a bit intuitive, but this naive random search is much more competitive to grid search. Uh, especially as soon as you have uh, more dimension. And here it doesn't also depend on the discretization. Of course, you may think, yes, grid search is quite naive. Can we do better? Of course, we can do better. And uh, when I mean by better is called Bayesian optimization. So in Bayesian optimization, what you do is you have actually, you learn a surrogate model. So it's a model that's given a configuration or a set of parameters it will estimate what is the performance that you will get. And this is, um, in, in the figure, this is the black line. Um, and this model comes with some uncertainty. This is a, the, the blue uh, area that you, should, you, you see on, on the screen. And, and the way it works is you, uh, you, will, you will start with some uh, random configuration that you sample. This is an observation that you see here on the screen. And around those observations, the uncertainty, uncertainty is quite small. What you want to achieve is reach the maximum performance. Here, the objective function, the true objective function that actually you don't know is in dotted line. And to achieve that, what you do is you use an acquisition function. So acquisition function can be defined in different way, but here I'm just using the most op optimistic point. So you're taking uh, the surrogate model output plus the uncertainty and you're assembling the point that is the most promising one. And by doing so, you will have a result, which is the iteration three with a new observation. You will update the surrogate model, which means that the uncertainty near that new observation will actually uh, go smaller. And the acquisition function now is updated. So it's where uh, the acquisition function is actually uh, telling you where you should sample to maybe get the, the best results, given the surrogate model and given your uncertainty. And you iterate again, and quickly you see that in very few iteration, 
we are pretty close to the um, here to the global maxima of the objective function. Um, so based on optimization for hyperparameter tuning, usually you will see Gaussian process or also uh, an algorithm named tree of pass and estimator or TPE. And uh, so Bayesian optimization is one way of being a bit more smarter about how to sample hyperparameters. You have other methods which are population based, like evolution strategy, so evol uh, like CIMA ES or normal uh, evolution strategy, or again, population based algorithm like particle, particle swarm optimization. Is there any questions so far? Because I went a bit quickly, I think, on the process on the Bayesian optimization. The question online. Still a question? Okay. Then I assume it's clear. So I just presented the different sampling algorithm that you may have for hyperparameter tuning. And the second component is actually uh, the scheduler, so or called pruner, which decides how do you allocate budget uh, for each trial. So one simple example of it, which is actually quite effective, come from Google Vizier, and it's called the median pruner. Is at an inter intermediate evaluation step, you take a look at the performance that you get for that intermediate result, and you compare it to all the intermediate results that you had so far at that step. And if it's worse than the median of the other results, then you discard it. And it's, it's a very um, simple heuristic, which is actually reduces, uh, which reduces the number of trials quite quickly. Another one, a bit more advanced, is called successive halving, which is really what I presented in the beginning. So you start with many configuration, you allocate a minimum, uh, budget for each of those configuration. And then, uh, depending on, on, well, on the set and threshold of the budget, you will reduce the number of trials and only keep the most promising one. The problem is, here you add actually two hyperparameters. You add uh, what is the minimum budget per trial and well, how many trials do you start with? And also, how do you reduce how um, uh, aggressively do you reduce the number of trials that you are trying? So that's why there's an algorithm called hyperband, and I would also highly recommend you to read the paper. It's quite clear, and it, it's quite nice to read, um, which actually does a great search on this hyperparameter um, to, um, to, uh, to have the best combination. So it, it, the way it works, it, uh, it launched different successive adding in the parallel, and it, it tries with many uh, combination at first, but then it has a high re reduction factor. But if it starts with uh, only a few number of configuration, then the reduction factor is much smaller and you will get allocate more budget to all the trial. Uh, so that was the pruning, the scheduler, which is how do you look at budget per configuration? Is there any question now? Everyone digesting? No question? No question. Okay. I'll throw one out there. Uh, as you start increasing the number of hyperparameters, mm -hmm. how do you decide on how far these hyperparameters should go before you start cutting? You, you mean the first trial should go before you start cutting off of the configuration? Uh, how, how do you decide? So, when, when do, how do you decide when you start cutting off? Um, yeah, when do you, when should you prune? Yeah, actually, so the, the way you do it, you can, at, in fact, at first you can start without any pruning. So you can give maximum budget to all your trials and just use from space and optimization. But usually you have a good, because it's that specific, you may have a good estimate at which point you can decide to see if the, the trial is really bad and you can discard it or it may be promising. And you may have uh, an idea, a rough, rough idea of how much budget you should allocate um, as a minimum to distinguish between very bad ones and maybe good ones. 
but it's it's really test specific, I would say. And if you don't know, then you can just not use any code. Okay, so is that different from other factors? Choose start putting at twenty-five versus fifty percent on board. No, it's it, this is just an example. Uh, what I've shown, uh, actually, the algorithm that uh, are using a bandit algorithm in the behind the scene, they um, they don't cut uh, regular interval. They just they allocate more and more budget to the remaining trial. Here, I just showed that for simplicity. So there was another question. Yeah, it seems like if you were um, uh, optimizing on a non-convex space, that if you had something converting more quickly, but to a, a lower performance that would be selected over something that converts more slowly to a higher absolute performance, how do you try and guard against that? Exa so the, yeah, so exactly. What, what may happen is if you prune too aggressively, is you will keep only the, the trials that reach uh, an okay performance very quickly, but then may be, um, that may plateau afterwards. So one way to uh, counteract that is actually to prune only later on, or to um, be less aggressive on the pruning. Another question? So the question is, how do you define budget? So um, in case of reinforcement learning algorithm, the budget can be the number of training steps that you allocate to your team. So the, the vertical lines here are uh, when you do intermediate evaluation of, of the agent. Any question online or here? Okay. So we have seen um, what is a sampler, what is a pruner, and now let's let's dive into how do you do that in, in practice with Optuna. So there's, there's many uh, library that you can find online, but Optuna provides actually a clean API. It has very good documentation. There's many features like um, multi-objective optimization, many sampler and pruners uh, included, and a dashboard also. And it, it has also many examples of integration with different library. And we have actually a SB3 example in that uh, repo. So, what are the different steps that you need to do to tune uh, um, an algorithm? First step is you need to define a search space. So what are the parameters that you want to optimize and what are the bounds, uh, the boundaries of, of that search space? Mm -hmm. Then you need to define the objective function. What do you want to optimize? So in RL, usually we want to optimize performance, but you may optimize functions for energy efficiency or you may optimize for fast training. It's, it's up to you. Then you need to choose a sampler and a pruner. And then finally, you just run the algorithm and don't forget to take a nap while it's running. Um, of course, uh, everything I'm presenting here is included in the RSO, which is the training framework I presented that morning. So how do you define your search space? Here, I will still stick to the RL uh, example and, and see how do we sample for instance, PPO parameters. And for sampling, you mainly, with Optuna, you mainly have three uh, methods. One is for categorical variables, so discrete variables. One is for integers, and the last one is for uh, continuous variables, so floats. So for instance, the first thing we would like to optimize is the activation function. And for that, we will choose between two activation functions, hyperbolic tangents and relu. And we just need to pass the list of choices and, and, and Optuna will, will then sample one for us. We can also uh, decide how many steps we want to do for collecting data. And here we pass, so we will sample an integer and between 64 steps and 2048 steps. And the last thing we may want to optimize here is for us, it's a learning rate. Um, and we will sample it between one to the point minus five and one, but we want to sample actually more um, closer to the lower bound, and that's why we are using a log distribution here. So overall, and finally, you pass actually those hyperparameters, you pass them to the constructor of your algorithm, and you can start training. So this is how to define the search space.
then you need to define the objective function. So it's a two part thing. First part is actually uh, the evaluation part. So for that, I'm using a callback, which will be called at a given interval. So during training, that's the vert vertical lines that I had in the figures. So from this quarter of the budget. Then we evaluate the model uh, with a separate environment and collect here what we want to optimize is the mean uh, aesthetic reward. And we here the evaluate policy, policy is actually the method that you have uh, normally coded this morning in the exercise. Finally, well, finally, then you report this mean reward to, uh, to Optuna, and Optuna will tell you, according to the scheduler on the pruner, if you should prune it or if you should continue training. And that's what this callback does is when you return false, it will stop training. Uh, and if you continue true, it will continue training. So this is the part for evaluating periodically um, the, the trial and, and sending the report to Optuna. The second part is actually uh, defining the model, sampling the uh, hyperparameter, training the model, and then uh, sending back to Optina the final performance. So what we do is we have some default hyperparameters and we update them using the sampling function that we just defined uh, above. Then we create uh, the algorithm. If we instantiate the algorithm using those hyperparameters, we instantiate the callback, we just defined before. And then we call the learn method to, so to train on the maximum budget. The thing is, because we pass a callback, this may terminate early. Uh, here, end time step is the maximum budget that you, we want to allocate to the trial. And so if it's pruned, we, uh, we tell Optina that it was pruned. And if not, then we report um, the last uh, mean episodic reward to Optina, and we consider that as our objective function. And finally, uh, we need to choose a sampler and pruner and just launch the study. So here I'm using patient optimization, so TPE sampler. The starter trial means we will do, uh, we will sample five trials before actually using the patient optimization. It is used for initialization of the patient optimization. Uh, we can use also a pruner here, the median pruner. Again, we, we will give some starter trials, so we won't prune anything before five trial to have a good estimate, a better estimate of what is the median result that we should expect. And uh, we say also here the warm up step. This is the mean resource that we allocate to a trial. So here I'm allocating um, a third of the total budget uh, for each trial. And then with Optina, we create the study because we want to maximize uh, the cumulative reward. The direction is maximized. We pass the objective, we give the maximum number of trials that we want to run. And, and then Optima will directly launch and sample for us different, uh, the different trial and report everything. Then the good thing is this, you can distribute everything. And if you have a cluster, you can have multiple nodes doing hyperparameter optimization in parallel. At the end of optimization, uh, Optima will, you can save everything in a database, but you can also save everything in a pandas uh, data frame. And you can plot, do different plots that are included in Optuna and for us to just get the best trial with the best hyperparameter form so far. Um, so again, this is uh, how you do it in practice. You choose a sampler, a pruner, you have defined your objective function that you give to Optuna, and uh, then you just launch a study and, and wait for, for the results. The good news is if you use a database, you can launch it. Uh, kill it and then relaunch it later on, and it will have already all the trials that you've done so far. Of course, um, there's some common pitfalls that you need to know, especially when you, uh, you use hyperparameter tuning for RL. Most of the time, you actually don't use hyperparameter tuning because you may, one solution to bad performance is just giving a larger budget to your algorithm. Another thing is you may have also online, you may find hyperparameter that are already suited for your problem. And if you take a look at the RSO, we have already many tuned hyperparameters for many tasks. So the best thing usually to do to avoid actually, because it still takes time, even though you don't do anything for a while, is to check if there's a task that looks 
like your task and check if there's already tuned hyperparameter that you could use. Um, one important issue with RL is you may know that the, the result may depend on the seed. So one way, which means that if you run the experiment twice with the same hyperparameter, but with a different random seed, you may get a different result. And that's a huge problem, which means that you have a noisy evaluation. One way to counteract that is to actually do multiple evaluation or do a, so during training, you do multiple evaluation, you train the same agent, but with different random seed. It takes the problem, it takes more time and it's, it doesn't go so well with pruning. Or the other um, thing you can do is as a post processing step, you uh, take the 10 or 20 best trials you have found so far and you evaluate them uh, multiple times and you just keep the best ones in, in this restricted set. Uh, again, same same for RL. In fact, you need to be careful not to have a two the search space that is too wide or too small. Too small, uh, you may not find the best performance, and too wide, well, it will just take forever to find any good hyperparameter. Um, and one way also to counteract that is if I don't know your real finance budget is one minute step, you could do hyperparameter tuning on half your budget, uh, um, and usually it will. Uh, it will transfer in the sense that trials that were found best for this limited budget may uh, may also be best for the longer budget. So it, it's not always the case, but it's worth trying because it's, it saves a lot of time when you do hyperparameter tuning. Um, and then even after all those steps, you may still have trial that may work and not work. And here it's always good to have some knowledge about the algorithm that you are using. So for instance, if you have from tune hyperparameters but that work most of the time or over time the performance degrade or go unstable then you may do some manual tricks like reducing the learning rate or augmenting the replay buffer size this requires a bit of knowledge about the algorithm but this it is also usually quite useful so i've talked about sampling pruning and how to do that in practice with optina is there any question yeah. Yes. There's in the chat. There's a question. So, in training, uh, reinforcement learning and using the, these high parameter tuning approaches, would one totally avoid the possibility, the, the possibility of having a lucky C with optimal rewards, um, since the system is always random? So the. I'm not sure to understand the question, but I, I think, I think the, the answer is it was about the noisy evaluation, which okay. is you, of course, it, yeah, I think that the, the question was about the noisy evaluation. And the answer is yes, you may actually end up with the best hyperparameter be just a lucky seed, but that's why you should do a post processing step or do a multiple evaluation during training. Is there any other question in the audience? Everyone's tired. Oh, the, yeah, and also, um, which uh, performance metrics are uh, important to consider for hyperparameter tuning? So the question is, which performance metrics are important to consider for hyperparameter tuning? Well, it depends what you want to do. Uh, but usually in RL, what you want to do is maximize performance. So you usually maximize the mean episodic reward. But if you want to uh, actually, not be sensitive to outliers. You may maximize more the median. Um, it, it depends on what you want to do. But usually, in RL, you want to maximize the mean episodic reward. No more question. So, um, just as a recap of what I just presented, so um, I hope that you will use automatic hyperparameter tuning when possible and also when needed and not do manual training anymore. Avoid grid search at all costs, at least use random search if possible. And um, don't forget about the pitfall mm -hmm. of uh, hyperparameter tuning for reinforcement learning. So what's next is actually a practical session where you will experiment by yourself manual tuning, and then we will put up together uh, automatic hyperparameter tuning and see that it's actually um, much easier to just let the algorithm do the work for you. But I would propose also probably 10 minutes break or five minute break. 
So let, let's do a five minute break because everyone seems a bit tired. And then we will uh, come back. Yeah, this is a question. Like whenever I've done like this, like ever in training, I just started like narrow like that like you're optimizing. So like it's great. Are these techniques better than that? Uh can, can you I'm not sure if you get the question. So like 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 if I if I'm writing like some sort of like logic program, I I have a program to I did like side talk, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, yeah, how do I how do I optimize hyper parameters? So uh, I'm I'm not sure to understand. So I think the question is why not using nonlinear optimization? Yes. Okay. So the thing is, what you're optimizing may not be differentiable. May um, maybe sometimes it's here it's mostly black box optimization. Um, of course, if you have some gradient information, don't use black box optimization because you will lose time. But here it's something. Usually, when you optimize those parameters, it's something you cannot differentiate, you cannot have access to intermediate values. So you just a black box that you need to optimize. And those algorithms are, are very suited actually for small search space in the sense small, uh, you have a small number of parameters and uh, units, yeah, and you can distribute it quite quickly. But of course you have other method, but this is more targeted towards black box optimization. And this is quite general, so it applies to any any time that you have parameters you want to tune for a PID controller, you have a proportional gain for the derivative gain that you need to tune, you could use those methods. Yeah, another question. I have a question. I guess you also use this for the hyperbolic. Can you maybe speak in the mic? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was wondering you probably use this as well for the reinforcement learning to make. Choose the neurons and the size and depth. Uh, I would like to know, maybe from your experiences, uh, you probably know much more than you. What you what do you say is the biggest culprits in terms of like what would improve the performance the most from all RL parameters, size of the networks, etc. Okay, so the question is, yeah, what what type of parameters are actually the most useful when you want to optimize for performance? Um, yes, actually. It, it, it depends on the algorithm, and if you knew it in advance, you would probably not do automatic hyperparameter tuning because you would just uh, tweak things automatically. But usually, having a slightly bigger network uh, also increases the performance. But then you need to tune the other parameter related to that once the learning rate or the batch size. And um, yeah, so also having a higher learning rate will usually um, make your learning faster. But it will make it uh, more stable. Same thing if you have a smaller replay buffer size, it will usually make your um, training faster because you will uh, sample the more recent history more often. But it may also make the, the training more unstable. Um, so I don't really have a general answer. But usually, yeah, learning rate, uh, replay buffer size, uh, and network arch architecture are usually one of the most impactful things. But you will actually see in the in the call lab and the practical session afterwards that uh, you may have other things that may influence the performance, like the gradient clipping or uh, the number of steps that you use to collect uh, and estimate the gradient. So there's no general answer, and I think that's also why you need to do it automatically and not defined by yourself. Was a question online? Let's come back in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that will prepare. And, and of course, the, um, the next notebook is on the website. It's called Hyperparameter Tuning with Optima. Um, if you have a hyperparameter that can be optimized as a categorical input or a range, which would you suggest to go with? Yeah, so the question is if there's a parameter that you can um, discretize or um, can should you use categorical or should you just ask uh, a range? 
I would suggest to use the range because then the algorithm knows actually that this um, this is a range and that two values are similar or not. Whereas for categorical, it, each value is assumed to be independent. So usually it's, it's better to use a range, but sometimes if the number of and fact variable that you want to try is very small, you can also use categorical and that will use uh, give more of the same result. 